it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Kimball, who has spoken with our club a couple of times. He's a professor of communication and arts at Seton Hall. Uh, he has studied domestic propaganda, war rhetoric, and visual imagery. And his research on World War II uh, has reached a worldwide audience of over 1.2 billion people in many, many languages. And he's a founding editor of the academic journal Homefront Studies. He's been a guest curator and a catalog editor for Norman Rockwell's museum, um, major international traveling exhibition, Enduring Ideals, Rockwell, Roosevelt, and Four Freedoms which opened at the December Houston uh, Museum of Fine Arts. He is a distinguished honor graduate of the US Army's Chaplain School, uh, Center and School, and he served as a Fulbright Scholar in Croatia and has been a senior fellow at the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies. He is author of the Mobilizing the Home Front, War Bonds and Domestic Propaganda, and Prairie Forge, the extraordinary story of Nebraska scrap metal drive of World War II, as well as a writer and co-producer of the movie documentary Scrappers, How the Heartland Won World War II. His most recent book, co-edited with Tricia Goodnow, is called The Tencent War, Comic Books, Propaganda, and World War II. So without further ado, I will let uh, Dr. Kimball take over. Thank you, Dr. Schoenberg. Now we'll see if we can successfully share my screen here. And looks like we want. And uh, before we start again, everybody, please mute your uh, please mute your telephones. And Jim, once you're co-host, you may have to admit people if you see it pop up on your screen. I'm not sure how that works, but we'll figure okay. it out. Yeah, one just came up. So we, um, if anyone else sees that pop up, let me know. Yeah. I may be able to get to it too, but if I can't, then if you see it, but. All right. Show is yours. Okay, so we'll go ahead and share this screen. Does that come up for everybody? Okay, it does. see that? Yeah. All right, so, well, welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, in some ways similar, but also some ways different from uh, teaching a classroom, and I, I had two classes earlier today, today, so I may be still in lecture mode. Um, but preparing this talk on, a, on a, the very day when I'm talking to classes makes me think um, about the challenges of teaching uh, that I don't face quite so much with this kind of audience. Uh, so perhaps you'll identify with the situation that I find myself in with my students. Um, there's a generation gap. My students these days uh, are typically born in the 21st century, which just boggles my mind. Um, and there's just a huge list of things that they've never experienced or only know about uh, from videos. Uh, think about rotary dial phones. They've never had that experience of a rotary dial or a midnight run to blockbuster video. They barely even know what VHS is or let alone albums on cassette tapes or eight track tapes. Perhaps there's some folks here who remember eight track tapes. They'll never have the experience of getting lost in the frustrations of unfolding a paper map and then having to refold it because they have their GPS. And the yellow pages that they use are neither yellow nor are they pages. Right? So they're very different uh, from me in a lot of respects. So when I tell them that I graduated from college with my bachelor's degree in 1989, I can feel this barely suppressed gasp of disbelief, right? That's might as well be the ancient world, I'm so old. Um, they would be just as shocked perhaps uh, to hear me say that I took time in between my classes while an undergraduate to deliver care packages to Washington's troops at Valley Forge. That's how old they might believe that I am. So for today's students, it would be easy for them to assume that I'm old enough to remember World War II and all that happened during that war. And so I would have experienced firsthand the United We Stand campaign, which is the feature of this talk tonight. It was an incredible campaign 
in the summer of 1942 to feature the US flag on the cover of every single magazine in the country. And they very nearly succeeded in that goal. But I don't remember that campaign and I don't remember World War II. I was born in 1966. However, I do have a parallel memory, which is my starting point or my entry point to the 1942 campaign. My parallel memory is from 1976. So I'm sure that many, perhaps most of you, all of you here tonight, uh, remember that 1976 celebration on July 4th, 1976. It was, of course, the bicentennial, America's 200th birthday. And for that day, Congress resolved to encourage the nationwide simultaneous ringing of bells. And at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, President Ford rang a bell on the USS Forrestal. At the same time, the Liberty Bell was rung, one of the very few occasions when it has been rung. And for the next two minutes, across all 50 states and all the US territories, communities, places of worship, fire departments, schools, individuals, all of them in unison, sounded bells and carillions and uh, sirens. Local radio stations broadcast these two minutes into homes, into businesses, into retirement facilities. It was that moment precisely 200 years later from the moment when the Liberty Bell proclaimed the independence of a new nation. Now those two moments really didn't stand out to me in my own childhood memories, and they inspired a lot of commentary that I've since discovered uh, after the fact. I'll give you some uh, quotes from the media. Here locally, the Hackensack record said, at 2 p.m. this afternoon, the Liberty Bell will be rung. And a moment later, bells across the nation will begin to peal at 8 a.m. in Hawaii and at 5 a.m. in American Samoa. You can sense that sense of wonder in the Hackensack record. There was also a sense of unity that came about because of this peeling of the bells. bells. The Associated Press said the next day, an almost tangible sense of national unity emerged from that ringing of the bells. This spontaneous moment of uplift after the long, sad years of Watergate and Vietnam. And lastly, in a letter to the editor to the Columbus, Nebraska Telegram, a woman named jo Joan Cromwell had this to say. Today, when I heard the church bells ring, I felt as if I could hear the bells all over the nation. I'm gonna keep voting in November, paying taxes in April and going to church on Sunday. Like the bumper sticker says, America, love it or leave it. I love it. Rather poignant letter. So looking back from my own memories, I do remember that moment and how poignant it was. I don't remember Vietnam very much at all. I certainly don't remember Watergate, but that moment on July 4th, 1976, that moment of togetherness, the idea that millions and millions of people whom I would never meet were participating in this ritual moment, that somewhere there was another 10 year old who despite our differences was also ringing a bell and that we were all somehow Americans despite our differences. It was powerful, it was incandescent, it was a transcendent moment. And that's the moment for me, my personal memory that comes to mind when I think back to the 1942 campaign, because I think there are some important parallels in that sense of unity even though I wasn't around in 1942, as my students must think that I was. And there are some similarities. Here in 1942 as well, was a nation facing some tough times. Here was a nation in desperate search of unity, although we've often forgotten that in our histories. And here too, was a national community 
using symbols as a means of uniting the populace. Now, looking back from the perspective of 2021, you read the headlines along with me every day, I'm sure, our national splits and divisions and fissures are again on prominent display, whether it's left and right, urban and rural, red and blue, but whatever one's political, spiritual and emotional beliefs, I believe that the United We Stand campaign is a powerful reminder of what unites us. And more specifically, it calls attention to the importance of the US flag as a potent symbol of national unity. And in a little bit, as you'll see, we're going to look at some of those magazine covers and I suspect you'll have a similar reaction. They also might make you wonder, why did we need this kind of display? Maybe I'll go back so we can look at those again. Why did we need this kind of display? What was behind it? Well, those questions are all the more important when we realize that World War II is in many respects still with us. It may be history, but it's also very much in the present. As scholars Keith A. Crawford and Stuart J. Foster write, we can't escape the powerful hold that World War II has on us. It's part of our everyday discourse and its presence is visible all around us in ideological, political, and academic debates, as well as in popular cultural relics, monuments, and memorabilia. So this talk is history on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's also autobiography, for it also is tells us something about us as Americans, whatever the period. And I imagine that these are the sorts of questions that will come up in discussion uh, after this part of the presentation is over. So let's go back to the title. With those thoughts in mind, I think we're prepared to dig into the role of American unity in World War II and why the flag campaign from the magazine industry was so essential. Specifically tonight, here's the structure that I have in mind. I wanna spend most of the time, the first three areas, talking about why this campaign was so important. These reasons that we've so often forgotten in our histories, why we were seeking a kind of unification despite the fissures and the pressures of division, even in wartime. Then in the last section, we'll dig more deeply into the campaign that resulted, and you'll have a chance to see some of these amazing images that the greatest generation produced as that means of unity. So here we go ahead and begin with the isolationists and the interventionists. Are you ready? You're all muted, so you just have to nod your heads. Yes, you're ready. Uh, we're, we're gonna jump into our time machines, reference to Back to the Future here. And we're going back to the eve of World War II. February 1939, Stagecoach, starring John Wayne, premieres. That's one of the major events on the eve of World War II. In March 1939, there's a new college student trend, swallowing live goldfish. Uh, even more bizarre than what my students do, I think. In April 1939, The Grapes of Wrath is published and becomes a phenomenon. In May 1939, Batman makes his debut in Detective Comics number 27. And of course, later that year in September, 1939, Germany invades Poland and in effect sets Europe on fire. Now, if you've taken any course in American history or 20th century history, you're well aware that Americans were observing these events very closely. But unlike what we remember in most of our histories, those Americans of the late 30s and early 40s were not united. They were split in very bitter ways. We remember, when we do, that split under the labels isolationists and interventionists. The names are somewhat self-explanatory. The interventionists were those 
who wanted to intervene in that European war, more specifically on behalf of Britain, which before too long became what was seen as one of the last bastions of European democracy. On the other side were the isolationists, those who wanted nothing to do with what they saw as a European war, and of course across the world, a Pacific Asian war. There was this widespread belief among isolationists that the oceans on either side of the US were a formidable barrier to any attack and there was no reason for us to become involved. Now this split between the isolationists and the interventionists was heartfelt and it was emotional. Uh, when FDR in September, 1939, the same month that Germany invaded Poland, proposed repealing the Neutrality Act, angry isolationists flooded the Senate office building. Here's a report from the time from the journalist Herbert Agar, who said that these isolationists who were in the Senate building were screaming about merchants of death, the House of Morgan, British propaganda, and similar phrases. It was not, the journalist said, a pretty picture of democracy at work. A year later, in 1940, FDR aide Harold Ickes wrote in his diary about the tenor of the moment. He said, America isn't going to be any too comfortable a place to live during the immediate future. Some of our super patriots are simply going crazy. Those are some powerful words describing his first person uh, uh, perspective on what was happening. Now, our popular histories in the years since uh, the eve of World War II tend to suggest that Pearl Harbor was this sort of magical wand that ended that division. We were attacked and suddenly Americans were united. One example would be Jeffrey Parrott's uh, popular book, Days of Sadness, Years of Triumph. Here's what he had to say. Eclipsing the long, painful road ahead for Americans was the deep satisfaction derived from a new sense of community. Something of a family feeling prevailed. They were openly thankful for the newfound feeling of national unity and purpose. Typical was the headline that read, Americans all, national disunity is ended. But those sorts of memories are only about half correct. It's true, there, were, there was lots of media commentary about unity. That was a big theme in the newspapers on December 8, 1941. I'll quote a Chattanooga Times editorial, which said, we shall have unity now, and it will be expressed in many ways. Or the Richmond Times in Virginia, America has been shocked into unity. Argument is ended with the announcement that the stars and stripes have been attacked and our soldiers and sailors killed by the hundreds. Or in Nebraska, the Lincoln Journal Star, the attack at Pearl Harbor made it clear that the much desired unity and concert of action by the American people had been reached. But the record shows that those reports were overly optimistic. There was a growing sense of unity after this attack, but it was not in any way complete. There was a continuing rift. For instance, in April, 1942, about four months after Pearl Harbor. A secret Office of Government Reports study was completed. Here is its title, Isolationist Aims, Arguments, and Organizations. It listed 14 cities that continued to be focuses of what it deemed isolationist activity, much of it supported by anti-Roosevelt newspaper publishers, and much of it in the industrial Midwest. Further evidence, that spring, despite Pearl Harbor in recent living memory, 
one third of Americans responded to polls uh, as follows. They did not understand why the US was at war. One third of Americans. This prompted, this prompted uh, uh, Roosevelt administration officials to condemn the public lethargy and indifference. A few more examples. In March, 1942, uh, when Air Ra Ward Raidens in Queens circulated a petition for the removal of Mayor LaGuardia as the head of civilian defense, LaGuardia referred to them as isolationists, the dirtiest word he could think of. And he said, they've quieted down since Pearl Harbor, but they're still here. So by June, 1942, isolationist sentiment, continuing isolationist sentiment was a hot topic. Now, of course, these isolationists, so-called, could no longer oppose going to war. The US was at war. You can't oppose going to war when you're at war, right? However, their isolationism showed up in other ways. They were often reluctant to avidly support the war effort. They were slower than the prior uh, interventionists to meet war bond quotas and other goals. They often openly questioned the US war aims. Indeed, polls would later show that 20% of Americans in the middle of World War II supported the idea of peace talks with Hitler. It's kind of stunning when you think about it in retrospect. So that then is the first reason why this sort of unity campaign was necessary. That split between these two sides of Americans even after Pearl Harbor. So that's one reason. Let's now dig into a second reason why this kind of campaign was necessary. And that deals with the news of the war itself. What everyday Americans could read in the headlines about what was going on on the battlefronts. Now, from our perspective in 2021, you and I know that the Allies won World War II, right? You can look it up on Wikipedia, you can Google it, it's everywhere you look, right? We know how it turned out because for us it's history. But for people in 1942, it was not history. And a successful outcome to the war, victory, was not a preordained outcome. Indeed, as the historian Richard Overy argues, and here I'm quoting, allied victory might seem somehow inevitable now, but the conflict was poised on a knife edge in the middle years of the war. In fact, as this campaign that we're talking about tonight, the United We Stand campaign was being planned, the news from the battlefronts was almost entirely bad, right? it was almost entirely bad. Just about the only good news was from Midway, which was a surprise American victory in the Pacific. The historian John Keegan put it this way, it was the most stunning and decisive blow in the history of naval warfare. So it was, it was big news, but that victory was already taking place as the planning for the United We Stand campaign was underway, and so it would have had little effect on the campaign. Most of the news, in fact, was bad from a variety of fronts. For instance, in other headlines, German U-boats were sinking U.S. ships at an alarming rate, and you could read about that every day in the newspaper. On another front, in the Pacific, Japanese soldiers had already given the American military one of the worst defeats in its history at Bataan. And then there was Pearl Harbor, itself a horrific hor a headline. Much of the details were kept secret at first, but under pressure from the media, the Roosevelt administration gradually released more and more information and the absolutely horrific toll became part of the headlines as well. And then there were the rumors. Everyone, it seemed, was talking 
about the possibility of Axis spies and secret agents here to destroy the US on secret missions, and of course, saboteurs in our war factories. These rumors were everywhere. In terms of the home front and its participation, the headlines weren't very good either. One of the principal fronts was scrap metal. Scrap metal, as well as scrap rubber drives in the spring of 1942 were failing miserably to the degree that there were no, a number of folks in the Roosevelt administration who believed that the US uh, steel production would begin to diminish significantly by the end of 1942 without uh, Americans gathering scrap. And that of course meant fewer munitions and an, an, a decreasing preparation uh, uh, for being war ready. As I put it in my book, Prairie Forge, and since this is the World War II book club, I think I'm obligated to mention a book. Um, a, a half year after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the country seemed to be facing ruin. Okay, Or as one correspondent at the time put it, it's early in the war, but already the home team is trailing by two touchdowns. The headlines were not good. And this was a home front then in desperate need of something, anything positive to think about. Those headlines we've largely forgotten, and they tell a different story than many of our popular memories and histories reveal. So that's our second reason why this campaign was necessary in the summer of 1942. Let me give you one more reason. In some ways, the most important reason of all, and that's the bottom line. And what I'm referring to here is the financing of the war. The other major bad news of early 1942 was in fact war finance. Total war meant that the home front had to participate in nearly every aspect of the war. And that meant, of course, women in the factories and in numerous other sorts of occupations that previously had only barely been open to them, if at all. The construction of munitions, on the home fronts, which became, of course, a huge industry. As I've mentioned earlier, the gathering of scrap so that we could melt it down to create those munitions. The home front was pressured to stay in touch with the troops to keep up morale. That was an essential duty if you were on the home front. You were, of course, encouraged to keep quiet, to not share whatever information you might have that could betray secrets to the enemy. That's a lot of responsibility, but perhaps above and beyond all of these was the bottom line. We have to find a way to fund the war. With costs that eventually went north of $300 billion by 1945, this would be the most expensive war effort in history. And so you might ask, as they did at the time, where's all this money going to come from? For a while after Pearl Harbor, the Roosevelt administration actually considered simply taking the money from the public. In other words, you had money saved in the bank, it would go away because the government had grabbed it and put it to work. But there was a person in the Roosevelt administration who thought differently, and that was the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgan Dow Jr. His perspective was that American contributions of finances to the war needed to be voluntary, that they should be loans with interest. And how that worked was you would have war bonds that you could purchase. So for $18.75, you could purchase a piece of paper that looked very much like that, as you can see on your screen. And after waiting for 10 years, it would then be mature and you would be able to turn it in for $25. And in the meantime, the government would use your $18.75 to prosecute the war. So that's a lot of money that was raised through these war bonds. But unfortunately, in early 1942, the program was not doing as well as they had hoped. Uh, that summer, Roosevelt, who was a personal friend of Morgenthau, 
said this, Henry has promised to raise $1 billion a month and he's got his neck out. Let's let him hang himself if he wants to or else his head goes kaput. In other words, if your program doesn't raise the money, we're gonna find a way to make it coercive. So when the magazines, as we'll get to in just a moment, began planning the United We Stand campaign, Morgenthau was paying attention. As you'll see in a moment, most of the magazine covers specifically mention purchasing war bonds. And indeed the United We Stand uh, logo, a slogan, was in fact Morgenthau's uh, suggestion. Under his leadership, the Treasury effectively used this campaign by the magazines to piggyback uh, on the war bond campaign and to increase patriotism, thereby increasing the desire to purchase war bonds. Now, the Treasury was already pretty well grounded in these sorts of appeals. At about this time, uh, they brought on a professor of, of propaganda, an expert in appeals, especially during wartime, from Amherst College named Peter Odegaard. He was a professor of political science. Uh, and he advised Morgenthau and the War Finance Board to focus on what he called plus symbols. What are examples of plus symbols that he was talking about? He listed them in one of his documents, America, battleships, work, protection, home, freedom. He concluded, we must never lose sight of the things that we're called on to defend, the Bill of Rights, our standard of living, our homes and our families. And of course, he was well aware, as was Morgenthau, that the US flag, that very symbol of the nation, fit right into that sort of list as a powerful symbol of American unity. So for a nation that you needed some unification and needed some additional motivation to finance this war, United We Stand was a perfect symbol and a flag alongside it. So those then are three reasons why this kind of campaign in the summer of 1942 was absolutely essential. We needed to find a way to unite Americans as much as possible. With that, then we can turn to the campaign itself, the flags of July, as I put it on the screen. So what was this campaign? Let's go ahead and dig into some of the context. Specifically, the campaign was the brainchild of a man named Paul McNamara, who was a media publicist in the Hearst Corporation. In early 1942, he had this brainstorm of an idea um, of putting a flag on the cover of as many magazines as possible. He didn't know if it was possible, but he decided to bring the idea up at a meeting of the National Publishers Association, an industry-wide group of magazines. Now, of course, we know the magazine industry was huge in the 1940s, significantly larger than it is today in our world. There were literally millions and millions of magazine subscribers on the home front, and that didn't even count those who would purchase magazines like at a newsstand or a dime store, or even those who would uh, inherit a magazine, if you will, known as pass along readers. In other words, if I subscribe to a magazine and I finish it and I give it to my neighbor who's not a subscriber, that's yet another set of eyes on those appeals. So it was virtually every American with very small exceptions who had access to magazines during the war. But the magazine industry did have a special reason for wanting to wage this sort of campaign. They were a little bit desperate to get themselves into the good graces of the Roosevelt administration. They were well aware that Roosevelt in particular saw the magazines as having been rather tepid in their support of the war. Some of this was fueled by uh, the Saturday Evening Post, uh, which was largely isolationist and very powerful in its voice. 
but moreover, personal animosity between FDR and Henry Luce, uh, who was head of the Time uh, Corporation and its various magazines. Um, so there was some desperation on the part of the magazine industry to do something, anything, to show the, the administration that it was in fact in support of the war. So with that in mind, McNamara's idea was accepted rather avidly and enthusiastically. And soon after that, this flyer was sent out to every magazine publication across the country that they could find an address for. And what it did was it encouraged, it even cajoled, one might said, say, magazine publishers to place a flag on the July cover of their magazine or as close to July 4th as they get, as they could get. And that meant that some of these covers ended up being in June, some of them ended up being uh, in August. But the vast majority were on newsstands uh, by early July. And so in late June, these magazines started to come out. Well over 500 magazines participated in the campaign. Everything from Life Magazine, which of course is still familiar to us today, to Doc Savage, to Ladies Home Journal, which is still publishing electronically. And it wasn't just classical magazines, but comic books joined in the effort as well. Here you can see some examples from the comic book world, everything from Donald Duck to Dick Tracy and their flags being featured somewhere in some way on the cover of the publication. Now I'll grant you, as we look at some of these examples, that not every publication seems to have put their heart and soul into the campaign. Uh, their attitude seems to have been, huh, okay, I guess I'll put a flag on the cover and wash their hands and go home. Uh, so as an example, uh, you can see some of our uh, simple uh, instances, the American Mercury uh, and Liberty Magazine simply put the flag and the slogan, United We Stand. Um, and in neither case do we see an obvious appeal to purchase war bonds as many others would do. Most publications, however, took on this mission as a bit of a challenge to adapt their style and their subject to this new idea featuring a flag on the cover. And some of these efforts were rather notable, even historic. For instance, National Geographic magazine changed its cover design for the first time in 54 years. You've seen uh, National Ge Geographics, I'm sure, in somebody's garage, perhaps your own garage, right? And you know what their cover looks like. This is a dramatic change for them. Another example in a similar fashion is Reader's Digest, which traditionally places its table of contents on the front cover. But here for the first time in July 1942, it places the table of contents on the back of the magazine and the flag is front and center. Here's another example of a magazine that went above and beyond, American Home Magazine. The image that you're seeing was actually created from 748 flowers by the staff of the magazine, and they placed them on uh, the floor of the magazine's office and photographed it as part of their design cover. So that has to win some sort of award. And in fact, there was a contest associated uh, with these flag covers. The US Flag Association sponsored a national contest for what it deemed the best designs on these covers. And it hired some nationally known folks to serve as the judge, the, the panel. They included Margaret Bourke White and Edward Steichen, famous photographers uh, whose names we still recognize and a name that we still recognize as well, Norman Rockwell, perhaps the most famous or one of the most famous artists in America at the time. So they looked at all of these covers and assessed them, and they came up with a roster of winners in a number of categories. Let's take a look at some of the winners as deemed by this esteemed panel. 
The winner in the category of weekly publication was Time Magazine. And I have to confess, as I look at this now, having seen hundreds of them, Dr. Lameza has an amazing collection of them. Uh, this one seems rather plain to me, but there must have been something about it that stuck out to the panel. In the category of a monthly publication, Harper's Bazaar was our winner. And here, by the way, you can see that appeal by war bonds and stamps um, as the treasury was uh, so desperate for the magazines to include as part of the campaign. There was another category called organization or trade publication. And the winner there was the Merck Report, um, published in the interests of pharmacy and medicine, July, 1942. For a house organ, an internal publication. This is the uh, New York, um, and I'm gonna blank on what LIC stands for, um, but uh, you can see that our uh, child here is licking uh, a war stamp, um, which is the smaller equivalent of a war bond. Uh, and he's about to place it into an album. Once you uh, collected enough of those stamps, you could trade it in in the amount of 1875 for an actual bond. Um, so that's very much going along uh, in, the, uh, in, in the theme. And note, by the way, the pun here, it's in New York Lick or NY Lick, and our figure there is licking the stamp. So that must have stuck out to the judges. In the category of uh, covers that are taken from a photograph, the winner was this week, uh, the insert, for a number of newspapers on Sundays. And in the category of an image taken from an original drawing, Modern Industry was the winner. One more here before we get to the overall winner. The seventh category was an image taken from an original painting. And that was uh, Infantry Journal with this painting. And last but not least, we did have an overall winner as deemed by the esteemed panel. So this is House and Garden Magazine, featuring a painting by Alan Solberg. It's a flag framing a distant view of George Washington's Mount Vernon. People so enjoyed this cover that the magazine received hundreds and hundreds of copy requests. And indeed, in its very next issue, it printed a detachable version that people could frame in their homes. By the way, the artist, Alan Salberg, died in 1987 in Flemington, New Jersey. So he had some local connections uh, to all of us here. Well, now that you've seen these, these sort of all these covers, you may be wondering to yourself, okay, so what did Americans at the time think about this campaign? Did they in fact become united as that slogan, United We Stand, was calling for? I think that we can be frank in our diagnosis of the campaign. First, we have to admit that it's hard to assess unity. All you really have is poll data and anecdotal reports. Uh, there's no measure of unity, it's certainly not from the 1940s, that we can use to point to an up or down meter. So our assessment really has to be rather fragmented um, based on incomplete evidence. We can look at it perhaps in terms of the three fronts that I mentioned earlier, the reasons why this campaign was necessary. First, in terms of the isolationists and the interventionists. Here, I think we can conclude, knowing humans, that it's incredibly difficult to change underlying attitudes. And in fact, by 1944, as I said a bit earlier, a significant percentage of the public was still willing to negotiate peace with Hitler's Germany. So I sort of suspect that if there were some of those heartfelt isolationist views that have persisted and survived Pearl Harbor, this campaign probably didn't have much of an influence on them. In terms of the headlines of the day, those of course improved on their own, if you will. By the fall of 1942, after this campaign, American troops were on their way to North Africa and on the Eastern Front, the Battle of Stalingrad was underway even as this campaign came out. And both of those events began to shift the course of the war toward the Allied powers. 
So the headlines did improve by and large. War bond sales are a much better measure. And it turns out that in the wake of this campaign that they did begin to accelerate in the fall of 1942. However, they did wax and wane throughout the war years requiring the treasury to go on a series of war bond drives to again convince Americans to invest yet again. Nonetheless, I think that there are some pretty good signs that this campaign encouraged a sense of unity. I'll give you some testimony from some of the, the uh, newspapers of the day. The Mason City Gazette on July 8th wrote this. It was a good idea to have all of our magazines act in concert to show the flag on their July covers. The impact of this mass display was impressive, and it was infinitely better than the usual July covers of bathing gals. Here's the Minneapolis Star a day earlier. The results on American newsstands this week is pretty thrilling. The Louisville Courier Journal, the day before that, the patriotic and the exhortative effect of the mass display of flags has come at a time when, to quote Ed Murrow, the Allied cause is badly in need of a new ration of hope. And I'll offer you two more comments from the time. The La Crosse uh, Tribune, I didn't write down a date for this, I'm sorry to say. American window shopper, shoppers saw stars, but they were the kind of stars Americans like to see, the stars on old glory, and patriotism began to break out in a rash. Last but not least, the Red Bank, New Jersey Daily Register published a letter from Elizabeth S. Neal, who had this to say. Have you noticed that many of the prominent magazines each have the American flag as their cover theme? I think it's because we have at last seen the light of day and are really appreciating the fact that we are Americans and we have this beautiful flag as a symbol to represent our country. Now, admittedly, there was the occasional isolated voice that wasn't happy about this campaign. One of the voices was the Hattiesburg American, that's in Mississippi, which wrote uh, on uh, July 2nd, 1942, rather snarkily. An American flag on every magazine cover is a whale of an idea until you actually see an American flag on every cover, until you find you've carried home Harper's Bazaar instead of Collier's, which is what you wanted. So somebody curmudgeonly uh, wasn't a fan because of all the confusion. Nonetheless, overall, I think we can conclude that there are at least a few signs of success in this United We Stand campaign. Certainly, I would argue that it points to the importance of focusing on what unites us rather than what divides us. That was a feeling that I had back in 1976 during the bicentennial and the ringing of the bells. But today, in 2021, looking back from our perspective, that's an important lesson, I think, for us as well. Indeed, Today, some 79 years after these covers amazed and thrilled Americans, it's my hope that their lesson of patriotism and dedication and unity still reverberates with us. And if I could give my students generation one goal, that would be it. So that's about 45 minutes of contents on the United We Stand campaign. I'll stop talking at this point because I'm hopeful that this will prompt some discussion. And everybody, if you unmute your microphones, we can actually hear your questions. So on the bottom left of the screen should be a little icon to unmute yourself. Please do so. I'd like to thank Dr. Kimball. That was a great presentation. Entertaining, informative, visually beautiful. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, I learned a lot and I, I'm thrilled with it. So. Thank you for doing that. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to jump in and 
Dr. Kimball will do his best to, to answer them. I'll just throw in one comment that I always found amusing, and that is, you know, you had the isolationists, and I guess uh, the president has to deal with all kinds of groups, including his own Senate and Congress, but I found it amusing that when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, Canada was actually uh, a few hours before the United States in declaring war on Japan. Mm -hmm. So they beat us to declaring war on Japan. At, and Mackenzie King had no obstacles with his parliament or whatever, I forget what it's called in Canada, but he got it done. So a little bit of amusement there. Anyway, uh, questions, anybody? Uh, yes. Uh, this is Andrew Lane. First Hello. of all, hi, there was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, now, you are a university professor at Seton Hall? I am, yes. Uh, I know Seton Hall, it's a fine institution. What is the response you're getting from this generation of students to this information? I do get to talk about this. Uh, I'm housed in a, a college of communication and the arts. Uh, and so many of my classes are more oriented toward like persuasive speaking or presentation skills. But I do have a course called Propaganda, Religion and War, um, where these sorts of ideas do come up. Uh, you know, and we spend a lot of time in World War II since that's where much of my research uh, is oriented. Um, and I do have to say that it's eye-opening uh, for them. These are not ideas that we tend to share with our newer generation. Um, you know, the idea of the potency of images or uh, the importance of national unity. Um, I think that they've become so immersed because they're digital natives in our dispersed communities um, that it's, I don't want to say earth shattering, but it's a real awakening for them to have a sense for what prior generations may have gone through and how different it was from them. I mean, I guess the reason why I mention it is I, I have two graduate student children. One is extremely woke, mm -hmm. is a word you may or may not be familiar with in oh, this question. Uh, and the flag, the flag of the United States is a flashpoint yes. for certain university students and others. So I guess, I mean, my daughter would probably say uh, all kinds of interesting things in response to this. And I'm wondering if you're getting anything like that. Ah, yes, so that's a really good question. Um, and you know the the sense of of, of wokeness um, to you to use that term um, is very prevalent on university campuses these days. Uh, perhaps not so much uh, with private Catholic universities as Seton Hall is, um, but certainly in your Yales and your Harvards and your Berkeleys, uh, right? Uh, and so, but even at Seton Hall, you know, there's a, a small population, I would say, um, that have grown up in an environment where you're trained to look for offense um, and to seek grievance. Um, and I think that this is the case in our larger culture, um, not just on the left, but also on the right. Um, for some reason, we've developed in American discourse, this possibility for being upset about things and how wrong that is and how we should that shouldn't happen. But of course, in my view, you know, the spirit of honest and, and uh, strong deliberation and a clashing of ideas in a positive way is a positive. Um, and symbols like the American flag, I think it's perfectly fine to acknowledge uh, that there have been negative moments, shall we say, associated with the flag. Um, think My Lay, for instance, in Vietnam. Nonetheless, um, it is a national symbol. And to me, I think it's important that we at least teach uh, future generations that respect uh, is important, even if it's respecting other people's beliefs. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm doing my best. <laughs> with respect to 
uh, the last president and his supporters who um, seem to commandeer the flag when they drive, you see vehicles with American flags. And it almost became a sense of, if you flew the American flag, you were showing your support for Trump, which I never believed in myself. I mean, you could see evidence of that, but where do you think it stands now? Do, do people who fly the flag, are they just supporting Trump or is it uh, you know, just patriotism for flying the flag? Do you have That's a, a sense point. of that? That's a great question. Um, and this is kind of where I envision the discussion going, because I think that this 1942 campaign is very revealing. Um, it's like holding up a mirror to us in 2021. It makes us ask these sort of questions. Um, the people that you're referring to, um, it seems to me, uh, are the very same people who are standing up at uh, a NASCAR event or a football stadium uh, and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, and the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, singing the national anthem uh, fervently. Um, I do think that there is a sense of patriotism. It may be misguided um, in some of our population increasingly, uh, but I think that that sense of the importance of the flag is still there for a lot of people. Um, they've just often been misled in directions by um, misinformation, uh, what you know, the term fake news, um, uh, purposeful rumors, uh, false flag reports, um, lots of stuff is out there. Um, and I think it's become worse in part because of social media, um, which as you all know, uh, allows you to create your own bubble. In other words, if there's someone whom I don't disagree, who I disagree with on Facebook, it's very easy for me to unfriend them. Um, or whatever the equivalent may be on whatever social media channel you prefer. And ultimately the result is that I'm only exposed to those beliefs that I already believe. And that sort of trains us to see others as other capital O and bad and evil. Um, and we can maintain our symbols of patriotism, our flag, um, and think that they're, those people over there are wrong. Um, so what we're doing is we're limiting that discourse. I think that person who's driving their vehicle uh, covered with the flag in a violent way has simply lost their way. They're, they don't understand the people that they're hitting are also Americans and can also be very patriotic. I hope that answers your question at least. A it it does. It does. I mean, yeah. So Dr. You know that. Dr. Kimball. Oh, and by the way, uh, I don't know if somebody noticed I'm in Canada but I was thrilled to see somebody know that Canada actually beat the U.S. to declare war on Japan after Pearl Harbor, which is a little fragment of history. I come to this as um, passionate about history and with an arts background. I've got a blended question here for you, which right. you can tackle together or you can split it into components. Uh, stylistically, um, the flag's a, the flag's an intriguing symbol of America that was clearly chosen for this campaign, and I see a lot of use of the flag in other posters from the period. Uh, the Soviets, on the other hand, went with a very brutalistic style that was very much oriented around kill the Nazis your women will be raped, an absolute evil, which we must repel. Kay kind of went with, uh, be afraid of slavery because those people in France, they're slaves now. And you need to defend, invest your money, keep our boys flying, keep the planes in the air, keep the Navy at sea. Canada went with something that's very characteristic of Canada, do your share. <laughs> participate. Don't let the side down. So multiple styles. I'm curious your thoughts as to why and how effective the use of the flag was. And the blend then is you alluded to the idea that there's very little statistical evidence, but is there any statistical evidence 
that tells us the influence on isolationism, uh, not, not attempting to blend some other statistic on top that war bond sales went up, but anything that is directly survey studies, anything that suggests the impact of the campaign. Sorry for the length of the question. No worries. Uh, so these are good questions. Uh, let me address the second part uh, first, um, because I'm not aware of any statistical evidence. I mean, the closest that would have been likely to have emerged um, would have been secret at the time, uh, and yet uh, retained in the National Archives. Uh, so I get down there usually twice a year. I, of course, haven't for the last year and a half now. They've mostly been closed. And every time I'm there, I find new documents. Uh, the Office of Government Reports did a lot of polling. Um, some of the other uh, agencies, the Office of Facts uh, and Figures, uh, which blended into the Office of War Information. So they, they each had their own areas, uh, their own polls, where they were kind of selecting samples and measuring things. Um, and there were also university organizations that were doing this. There was a group out of Columbia, a group out of, of Princeton, um, Gallup was doing his own polls, Roper was doing polls. So amid all of that information, I think it's likely that I'll eventually come across something telling because the government was very interested in this question, very interested. Um, but it had an interest, I think, too, in keeping it secret. Um, as you saw, I, I did find that one uh, report on continuing isolationist sentiment, and it was very clearly labeled secret. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know how easy it will be to find. It's just a matter of going through box after box after box. So, so far, uh, I haven't found that evidence. I hope to someday. Um, in part because, and this will get up to your, your next, the, your earlier question, um, I have sort of on the back burner a, a, a book about the role of the US flag um, in World War II in my mind, it's not in the works yet, but you know, I have this idea about just writing various chapters about how the flag played a role. And that question is sort of top of mind. Um, what was it about the flag that made it so impactful for American audiences? I think in part, that's a cultural feature of Americans. Um, when I travel abroad, um, and I've been you know, abroad for three weeks or four weeks, uh, uh, and I come back uh, to the US or when I was in Croatia on a Fulbright for five months, uh, I came back, I see the US anew. And one thing that strikes me is how many flags there are in the US today. Um, and it's different than most other cultures uh, that I've come across. There may be some exceptions, but I, for some reason we're very flag oriented as a culture. And so it makes sense to me that that would be a very prominent theme in our propaganda of World War II. Um, that being said, uh, you mentioned a brutalist style, uh, you know, uh, appeals uh, from the UK about you know, being slaves like France, um, the do your share theme from Canada. Um, those themes appear in American propaganda as well. Um, if you uh, forced me to say, what is the unifying theme of American domestic propaganda in World War II, I'm not sure I could answer. Um, the flag is certainly prominent, um, but there's examples of each of those ideas that you've mentioned. Um, I'd be very curious if someone did uh, a, a thematic study um, and just looked at every single poster that was published, you know, if they could find them and see what those themes were. Um, so I hope that addresses your question at least a little bit. Uh, it does. Can I can I carry on with it for a moment? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I wish I could tell you where I read it, but many many years ago, I read an article that suggested that one of the things that made Canadian military units so effective during World War II and World War One, which they were, was that the commonality of hockey. If you're Canadian. You played hockey as a kid. You had a favorite hockey team. There was this absolute thing coast to coast you could talk about. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the States and other countries as well. I don't, you know, even baseball, 
uh, is to, in my mind more regional. Uh, football is somewhat regional. Hmm. Is the trick to this that the flag has been used? I mean, even if you look at um, Uncle Sam, he's he's wearing a flag. <laughs> is, is the trick that it's been used so often through history that it has taken on that role of this is us? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly in, in marketing theory, uh, public relations theory, um, there's lots of arguments about the, the importance of repetition. Um, so the, the mere exposure hypothesis uh, suggests that um, the more you're exposed to a message, the more easily over time it finds uh, to, uh, the ability to break through your defenses. So you might, may not even notice an appeal the first time. And the second time, you may ignore it, kind of notice it, and it kind of increasingly works its way into your, your consciousness. Now, the flag by itself isn't really an appeal. It's a display. Um, but when it's shown to you as an appeal, as in these magazines, um, it's in a prominent place. Um, so yeah, I can see something um, along those lines. And I'd be very interested in someone who was more, you know, I'm more uh, a critical scholar, historical scholar, um, someone who was able to do a quantitative analysis um, and maybe come up with some conclusions uh, about that. How often were people exposed to the flag? I do have one statistic um, and I'm gonna blank on the number here. Uh, but th this doesn't relate to the flag specifically, but rather to the Star Spangled Banner, the singing of the Star Spangled Banner. And there was a report in 1942 that in New York City alone, that song was sung over 10,000 times a day during uh, 1942 in World 42. War II. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's the song, but it is about the flag, right? Surviving onslaught from the enemy. Uh, so there's a lot of exposure, and I, I think that you're onto something here. Okay. 41. Thank you. All right. I know we have one other person who's trying to ask a question, but he hasn't unmuted himself yet. Okay. So if he, I, I texted or I sent a chat message. Let's see if he's come through. And if not, then we'll wrap it up. Um, you could also put the question in the chat and we could. Yeah, that's true too. If somebody doesn't have their microphone on the bottom of the screen, there's a little icon that says chat in the Zoom app. So you can send a text message. Come on. Come on. <laughs> so. While we're waiting, I just have a question for our Canadian brother or participant. Where in Canada are you? I'm about 75 miles directly north of Toronto. It sounds like uh, in uh, at the uh, what's the big Algonquin area? Uh, about halfway to Algonquin. Uh, I'm at the edge of what we call cottage country, meaning if if it was daylight, I'm looking out over a lake and I'm in a small town of about 35,000 people. So you have loons as neighbors. Not on this lake, but on a lot of other lakes. <laughs> are, are you familiar with a, a military organization out of Hamilton called the Rileys? No, I'm not. That's the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry. Oh, okay, sorry. Didn't know the nickname. <laughs> Well, that's that's all I got. <laughs> oh, okay. My my family has a. This is not a yay me, a long uh, tradition of service, and uh, it's something that comes with the family. And in fact, although I never went, I was accepted into RMC, and uh, which is Royal Military College, as a kid. Uh, so I am aware of light infantries and, and the various military facilities around the country. The town I'm in was actually a tiny little town in World War I, for example, 
but uh, about 5,000 people, but it became uh, a camp for training, early training of people from all over the country. And the population, there were more military people here, trainees during World War I than there were citizens by a lot. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap this up. The yeah. people haven't figured out how to unmute themselves. So I want to thank Dr. Kimball. I want to thank you all for participating. And uh, we'll see about next month. I'm still waiting for the confirmation from our lecturer. Thank you all for attending. Thanks, everybody. Thank see you later. You. Jim, I will be in touch with you. Um, uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll be in touch with you within a few days, OK? Hold on, you're, you're muted, so. Uh, hold on. Da, 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 da. For a great evening. Much appreciated. Okay. Thank you all. All right. So now we.